trend begins to develop, certain states lead the way. In this case, Wisconsin becomes known as a laboratory of democracy because they're trying all these new approaches to government. But other states will follow suit. Pretty soon you're going to have a reformed governor in Pennsylvania, and a reformed governor in West Virginia, and a reformed governor in Ohio. And La Follette is beginning to have conferences and talking to other governors, right? I don't know if you all know that about the country you live in, but this is the process with California's been a strong state in the last 30 years who led to the left. In recent years, other states have been moving us to the right and going away from regulation and, and away from a lot of public spending in the public sector, away from labor uh, laws. That would be Texas is the main uh, proponent there. And Tennessee has been moving in that direction too and some other states. But we have these trends that, move, that emerge. Uh, I do want to give you one more idea here. The Wainwright Commission. This is in the state of New York. They've got a problem with the fact that they've got hundreds of thousands of people working in factories. And they're working long hours, low wages. They don't have much savings. But then periodically, the factories just close down, understandably, right? The factory just says they're not going to make money enough, so they just close it down. That's fine. However, what about all the people thrown out of work? What happens then? What about somebody who gets injured on the job and can't work? Well, if they come up with, they want to do an insurance program. So the Wainwright Commission is a commission set up in New York, commission set up in New York to study the question of a workman's insurance against job loss and workplace injury, both of which would render them penniless. So the commission, made up of these experts, they're going to tell the legislature what it would look like. They're going to study the problem. They go to England, and they look at England's program, look at Germany's program, and they come back to the United States and say, okay, here's what we've come up with. Here's our proposal that we'd like to see the state adopt the legislative agenda. So, what they're going to do is they're going to create the Workmen's Compensation, we'll call it the agency. First question is, who all should have to abide by this law? <laughs> i got to keep going. They say, let's say all factories that have at least 50 employees will have to participate in this program. And it's a forced program. It's a forced insurance program. Here, so here's a factory that's got 50, 50 employees. What they decide is a percentage of their wages will be withheld. Anybody have a paycheck before? Anybody's got a paycheck? Raise your hand if you've got a paycheck. Have you seen something called withholdings? Yeah. What, are you, what are your withholdings? There's Medicare, Federal, Social Medicare, Social Security, and then Federal Taxes. Those are your withholdings. Do you get a choice on that? No. Okay. This is the beginning of that. They're going to say like 2% of your wages of all the workers in that factory are automatically withheld from them. You think the factory workers are very excited about that? They're like, darn, it's like $3. I was making 50 bucks a week. Maybe it's going to be like $1.50. Let's say that all the wages of this 50-something employees turned out to be... I don't know, $375. Here's the thing I'd like you to know. The workers contribute to it, and then the owners have to match it. You don't get to see the owner's part, do you, when you get your paycheck. But the owners have to match it. So how much money is that together for that week? Looks to be about 750 bucks, which the company is now required to send to the Workmen's Compensation Agency, which is a state-run agency now. The state's going to have to pay people to oversee this money and to make this program work. But if we centralize it like that, we can hopefully have some efficiencies. All right, so time goes by, and this, all these factories in New York are sending a little bit of money to the agency. And then you're at work, you're standing there, and then you know, your arm's stuck in the machine, and your arm gets ripped off, right? But luckily, you've got this card you filled out, so... You go to the Workman's Compensation program, you know, Bureau, you bring your arm in, you're like, this is my arm, hold this for a second, get him to hold it, pull out your card, and you're like, yep, I'm in the Workman's Compensation program. And you then... You can't sign because that was your good arm. That's true. <laughs> I thought about right. that. Well, no, that's a good question. So, I mean, does the person wish they had their arm still? Probably. Right? Because they're not going to get paid much money for this. They're going to be told, but you get $3.75 a week through this compensation program. It's not, their sal it's not what they were used to making. But they can buy um, Vienna sausages and crackers for their family. Uh, they probably can't go to Coney Island anymore, right? They're not going to be happy. 
But it is a program that keeps them from being utterly destitute. Maybe it's enough money to pay. They may not be able to stay where they were living. They may have to go live in a lower income area. Is that all great? It's not. They're not this program is not going to keep them in a really nice situation. But it's going to be enough that they and their kids meet some standard of living. The standard that they were on? No. But it keeps them from living in an alley. All right? And that's what America decides in this period. And I want you to know a name for this. It's called a welfare safety net. The welfare safety net. Western civilization has gone through a transformation. There are now millions of people living and working in factories, and they live close to each other. And there are huge economic problems for those individuals because of capitalism and just the way it's, it's developed. What we're trying to do is, here's what I want you to know, mitigate. We're trying to mitigate the problems of industrialization. Just make them a little better so that society does not get crushed or the individuals don't get crushed. Again, it's not some great program, but it's enough to keep us out of the alleys, hopefully. Here's what I want you to know next about this Wainwright Commission. The legislative committee that assigned this said, we like it. Let's move it on to the House for a vote. House vote says yes. New York Senate says yes, although some, some business owners are going, no, nah, I don't like this program. It's not, this, is like, this is just the beginning of socialism. And if we don't stop it now, we'll never get anywhere. Or they'll, get, they'll, take us, they'll take the whole thing over. So they're saying, no, bad idea. But it gets to the legislature, and it goes to the governor's office. The governor says, I'm for it. This will be good for New York. And he signs it. And they sit up at the budget, and money starts going in. They know that the state's got to kick some money in, first of all, to get it going. They've got to hire these agents. They've got to write the laws. And they start operating. But there's still this group of businessmen who are thinking, this is the beginning of socialism. And so they want to stop it. Can they stop it? What's, what's, what's your chance of stopping this? How can upset business owners stop this thing? They've already got the legislation. What can they do? They, lay, well, yeah, you're right. They could make sure they don't have 50 employees, couldn't they? Like, oh, all right, kind of fine. We'll just have 49 employees now. Right? They could do that. What's another way you could try to do it? Strike? Um, not so easy. What you need is a, a subsequent legislature that overturns it. Write a new law overturning that law, right? You could do that approach. But what if the people kind of want it? Well, your last place is the court system. And this is what happened to the Wainwright Commission in the in the work in this New York, the first effort of New York to get a workman's compensation program. Businessmen sue in state court, saying that the government lacks the power to do this, according to the state constitution. The judges, who are they going to side with? Who's their class? They are capital class people. They are the ones who have been put in. Remember that the, the businessmen have been running. The governors and the governors have been putting the judges they want. So the New York Supreme Court strikes down the Wainwright Commission and says it's unconstitutional. Does that make the people of New York very happy? That one small group stops what they believe to be a proper role for government in the economy? Forced insurance program like this? Are they mad at the judges? They're thinking, how do we get rid of these judges? And how do we make sure we get judges in the future that are better? So this becomes a bit of what they're going to call democracy denied, right? That's the phrase I want you to associate that. But it appears that the institutions are in the control of a few who just think about their interest. All right. It does. They do eventually get it, but they have to go. They've got to wait. Now, I've got a couple of federal examples for you. This is our federal progressives. This is... We get... Two progressive presidents. The most, well, it's, they're really famous presidents. There's Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. Progressive in that they are willing to have a new role for the government in the economy. And the, this is Theodore Roosevelt. We've talked about him before with imperialism. He ran as vice president in 1900 with McKinley. McKinley gets assassinated in the summer of 1901 and Roosevelt takes over. In 1902, he gets faced with his first national crisis. There's a strike going on. On your ID list, I call it your, the anthracite coal strike. It wouldn't be such a big deal except for the coal companies have formed 
into a trust. A large percentage of the coal production in America is under this one company, which operates in New York and Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina probably too. So this big company that owns all these mines that have consolidated. Anybody want to work in a mine? How'd you like to work in a mine 100 years ago? Right? Not a good thing. So they have cave-ins, they've got bad conditions, they risk their lives in there, and they get paid a little bit of money. And the owners don't really care about them, do they? I mean, when it comes down to it. So the miners want a contract with the company. And they want this contract to lay out how much they'll get paid for the next five years and what they'll do about worker conditions. The mine company says, no, thank you. We're not going to work with you guys as a contract with a union. And so the miners strike. And the owners say, fine, we'll just find replacement workers. Which would be kind of hard to do, but they think they can do it. Well, the owners have a problem. The miners have some leverage on them in stopping replacement workers. What would you do if you're a miner in a remote part of West Virginia and you knew they were going to bring in replacement workers? What could you do to stop the replacement workers from coming in? You could, how could you literally stop them from arriving at the mine? In a way that you would keep you from being arrested, maybe. You could drop trees over these little roads going up there, right? You could block the railroad. You could block the outflow of coal, too. And that's what ends up happening. Miners start actively intervening in this strike. So we have, this is a large labor dispute. And the, and the, the laborers have kind of, getting kind of not the upper hand, but they're really able to put some pressure on the companies. Now, the companies... The owners ask Teddy Roosevelt to send in federal troops to protect the approaches to the mines and to arrest the union workers who are dropping trees and disrupting things. Teddy Roosevelt probably could have done that, but he's beginning to... He understands that things are changing and that America needs to change, and so he does something dramatic. He won't side with the, the company owners directly. He starts, here's a cartoon that kind of suggests his position. This says strike district. Here's the strikers. They won't talk to the owners. And this is an image here. Y'all know who this is? I think you've heard of him. He's an iconic figure. Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam. Now, we use Uncle Sam when we have a crisis. When's the, when's the time we most traditionally use Uncle Sam? Election. And? Wars, Wars right? Uncle Sam wants you to come out. and do. So it's a patriotic issue. It's when society needs to make a demand on an individual. Does Uncle Sam look happy here? He's got his hat off. He says, posture is... This says the freezing public. He's mad at both of them, kind of. He wants them to get their act together because they're not going to get coal in the city and the price of coal is going to skyrocket and there's going to be people freezing to death. And there'll be businesses impacted by it. So here's what I want you to know at the end of it here. He threatens to intervene, but he says, I'm not going to pick size. I'm just going to nationalize the mines. I'm going to run these mines and sell the product. And I suppose, is that going to make the mine owners happy? No. So he says, here's what I want you all to do. I want the labor union to send representatives to Washington. And I want the mine owners to send representatives to Washington, and I'm going to set up an arbitration. We're going to sit you guys down in a couple rooms, and we're going to go over the issues which separate you, and we need to come up with a solution. What I want you to know, this is a dramatic shift in the history of the United States, because we have a president for the first time who is trying to force an accommodation between labor and capital, and not simply siding with the capital class. That's dramatic. And he has, a, he has a positive outcome. The union gets its contract. He tells them if he thinks they're getting a little bit too strong here on their... Well, he also tells the owners, that this is, I mean, really? Are you not willing to do these basic things? But of course, the, the owners didn't want to deal with unions at all because they were afraid that, that would ultimately force them to treat these people better. And that might intervene in their profits. All right.